Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 3rd, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we give you some preliminary thoughts on the impact of the earthquake on the state budget. Second, our thoughts on Governor Dunleavy's pick for DOR commissioner. We think it's a lost opportunity. And third, what the trade ceasefire between the U.S. and China likely means for the Alaska LNG project. And now, let's join Michael. So let's talk a little bit about your weekly top three. Uh, You've got some interesting stuff to start with. And of course, uh, first and foremost, since we're talking about the quake, Let's talk about the effects of the quake, the aftermath, the rebuild, the the cleanup, and everything else. What does that mean for us uh, as regards to the Alaska state budget? That's going to be your number one for your weekly top three. Well, it's early days, certainly, about uh, both the assessment of what the damage is going to cost uh, to government as well as how we're going to pay for it. But there's a few things that, that we can sort of have in mind, uh, uh, both from, you know, l- looking at how our budgets are constructed as well as looking at, you know, other states and how they've dealt with uh, with these sort of things. We do, we're going to have uh, significant cost to government. Uh, the schools, we've been talking about the damage to the schools, or you've been talking about the damage to the schools, uh, both in the Anchorage School District and in the Matsu School District. Certainly we have uh, highway disruptions uh, in various locations, uh, some bridges, uh, some overpasses, as well as as the highways themselves. Um, the University of, of Alaska Anchorage uh, was has been closed. Uh, there, I've seen some preliminary pictures of damage there. Um, so there's going to be uh, some uh, some costs arising. It certainly some costs arising out of that. The railroad. Uh, looks like it's getting back up and running, but uh, it's going to have to deal with uh, with some uh, some issues. Has already dealt with some, um, and is going to have to deal with others, and those are going to need funding. And then we start get, that's before we even start getting down to the municipalities, right? Uh, and the and the economic or the the cost of of their uh, the issues that uh, both the borough of Anchorage and the Matsu borough uh, are going to face, uh, uh, separate and apart from. Uh, from the cost of schools and uh, and 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 the road system, so there's a there's a number of places that uh, the costs are going to come from, um, and and you can uh, you I can sort of see somewhere somebody's starting to tick up what the what the cost is, of that is going to be, and of course uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure to uh, do these things quickly and to you know sort of don't spare the cost on getting our schools back up and running, don't spare the cost on getting the the bridges and highways back up and running. I'm certain there's going to be that sort of same sentiment about the university, uh, and certainly there's going to be that same sort of sentiment about the railroad. So there's going to be. I mean, the the costs are going to be already are uh, are are running up. Two probably big um, uh, funders. One uh, we we hope it's going to be as big as it can be uh, is the federal government uh, through uh, emergency funding and through federal assistance. Uh, for uh, uh, for the earthquake response and for dealing with uh, the costs that uh, that arise, um, federal funding, special federal funding for um, uh, natural disasters um, certainly is is something that uh, happens and has happened in other na- uh, natural disasters. 
um, the hurricanes that have hit uh, Houston, the hurricanes that that hit uh, uh, New Jersey and elsewhere on the East Coast, the recent, more recent hurricanes that have hit the Carolinas, uh, all have uh, had uh, substantial federal assistance uh, in dealing with some of the cost of those. But regardless of how uh, expansive, <clears throat> excuse me, the federal government's uh, assistance may be, there's going to be costs that are going to hit the state um, and the localities, the Anchorage and the Matsu Borough, uh, and they're going to have to, they're going to have to, they're going to be looking to the state as well. Those boroughs are going to be looking to the state as well. So we've got, we're going to have a significant amount of costs uh, uh, coming at us, and it's not the perfect time. Uh, for the state to be dealing with those, the, right? Yeah, the 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 traditional when you've asked people in sort of you know drills uh, in the past, uh, desktop drills, uh, where the funding would come from from the state has been the CBR, the Constitutional Budget Reserve. Um, you know, it's it's a savings pot that 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 you know people have said is there and and will be there to to help us deal uh, help us deal with situations like this, but we've drained. Uh, the CBR down to less than $2 billion the last time I looked at it, uh, just covering operating funding, just covering the deficits of the last uh, of the last seven years. I, a number that continues to stun me every time I look at it is we have uh, tapped our fiscal reserves for over 20, for nearly $20 billion uh, in, in, in savings funding that, that, that we've taken out over the last uh, seven years to, to fund these deficits. So when you look at the CBR, it is not uh, in the type of shape uh, that we needed to be in to be able to, to you know, safely uh, handle uh, a situation like uh, like we've just hit. So, right. And a CBR, for those people out there who may not know, is the Constitutional Budget Reserve. It's a constitutionally mandated savings account that is utilized, you know, to, again, for fiscal stability, because the state of Alaska does count on a very volatile revenue, oil, uh, source for, for revenue is oil. Uh, and uh, and that's what it's that's what it's there for is to try and even out the highs and the lows. But instead, it has been kind of drained dry. Yeah, it's 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 down, as I, as I say, uh, uh, at at very low levels, below two billion dollars. Uh, we, we owe something like twelve billion dollars to it back to it. Uh, it under the Constitution, it's we have an obligation to repay it. And uh, we owe about $12 billion out of that $20 billion, 12 billion has come from the CBR and we owe it about uh, $12 billion to pay back for uh, the deficits that, that we've covered by draws from the CBR over the, over the last seven years. So we're not, we're not looking at a, <clears throat> at a full fiscal cupboard, if you will, uh, to be able to, to handle uh, uh, any significant costs that, that hit the state uh, 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 arising out of this. That's going to affect, I mean, that's going to affect the localities. It's going to affect the schools who otherwise who, who want to be looking to the state uh, to help uh, cover some of these costs. It's going to affect the university who wants to look to the state to help some of these costs. The railroad uh, is a state corporation, and it runs on a fairly thin margin. Uh, and if it has significant uh, uh, capital costs as a result of that, it's going to be looking to the state and certainly the localities, uh, the Anchorage uh, uh, borough and or and the Matsu Borough, uh, no doubt, will be looking to the state for supplemental funding. So with the CBR drain, that really leaves uh, two places to be looking at. One is bonding, uh, going out with uh, bonds that would tap the, the, the financial markets uh, uh, with loans, essentially, uh, into the state to help cover some of this stuff, to be paid back over the next 10, 15, 20 years, whatever the term of the bonds might be. Um, and then the second place uh, that, that people are going to be looking to is to the earnings reserve account, the good old right. earnings reserve account, right. which is under the Constitution uh, can be appropriate. It's a part of the part of the permanent fund, but under the Constitution, it's a part that uh, that can be uh, tapped by the uh, legislature and if signed by the governor, um, appropriated funds out uh, to uh, to cover the, the the problem with the with the ERA, and we've talked about. Uh, this on the show repeatedly, and we'll keep talking about it. Uh, the problem with the ERA is uh, it's that money is invested as part of the permanent fund of the roughly 60 some odd billion dollars we've got in the permanent fund. Roughly a third of that 
uh, 15 to, to 19 billion, depending upon you know the point of time that you pick it, uh, a fourth to a third of that is uh, is in the earnings reserve account. So if you if we start using the earnings reserve account as yet another piggy bank, um, we're gonna it, it'll reduce the investment base, and the impact of that is to reduce first future earnings, and the impact of that is to reduce uh, future permanent fund dividends and to review uh, to reduce future draws. Uh, future money available uh, under Hammond 5050, future money available to, um, uh, to help fund government. So we're, we're going to be we're going to be in a fairly tight spot. I, I noticed that Governor Dunleavy uh, in an interview he did uh, yesterday uh, was asked by uh, Kyle Hopkins, I believe it was the reporter from the uh, Anchorage Daily News uh, about the governor's promise uh, during the campaign to uh, pay back uh, past uh, PFD cuts, uh, and and Governor Dunleavy doubled down, said yes, that's his intent. And Kyle asked where the funding was going to come from, and and Governor Dunleavy said the earnings reserve account, which as we've talked about on the program before, is going to lead to future PFD cuts. Uh, we're just kicking the cost of these deficits we've run uh, down the road to uh, to future Alaskans. Uh, and if we're if if we're looking to the ERA for that, we're going to be looking to it for uh, for help uh, funding these uh, the costs of the earthquake, um, and and we're going to have a, a huge debate I think this coming spring about about whether we were you know whether we ought to, how how much we ought to be tapping the the earnings reserve account, what the consequence of that if it's fair for this set of Alaskans this gener generation of Alaskans to be draining the earnings reserve down. Uh, and uh, at the cost of future Alaskans, uh, the earnings, the the permanent fund is there to treat all generations fairly, uh, and to treat and to treat all generations equally. And to the extent this just generation starts just taking money out of the investment base, taking money out of the earnings reserve, we're doing it at the expense of future Alaskans. And and I think there's going to be quite a bit of a debate about that. But some of it, some of it may be unavoidable, uh, depending upon how high. Uh, these costs are going to be, and right. uh, and and you know that's since we've drained the CVR, that's about the one source of of readily available funds that we've got uh, uh, to help cover these costs. Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets here on the Michael Duke Show. I guess the one good side to this is the CVR does require a, a majority draw, a super a three quarters a majority for the draw. Uh, and I don't think anybody's going to argue about earthquake relief. So there might be, you know, that might be where the money comes from versus the ERA. We don't know at this point. Uh, quick estimate, Brad, what do you think? Are we talking a billion dollars as far as damages and everything else? Or oh, you, what do you it think? Is, it, it's way too early to, to, yeah. to factor that in. I, I I would not be shocked at the end of this, uh, though, if we're, if we're well over a billion dollars. Yeah. I mean, you start looking around schools, localities, highways, university, the railroad. Right. Uh, and I'm sure I haven't thought of half of it. So. Right, right. Well, we'll uh, we'll have to uh, we're going to have to see about that. That's your number one here. Brad Keithley is our guest. We've run up against the clock. We've got more coming up. Don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show continues with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He's here to talk with us about where Alaska is going and what we can do to help keep us on track with a more sustainable uh, situation here. That's all directly ahead on The Michael Duke Show. Your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio, heard live around the world at michaeldukeshow.com and right here across the state of Alaska on this, your favorite radio station. Back with more right after this. We're broadcasting live through a series of tubes. Allowing all of these uh, entities to provide streaming stuff going on, on, the, on the Internet. Well, it's kind of hard to explain. Sorry. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Okay, we're back uh, with Brad Keithley here in the break, getting things ready uh, for the next segment. We'll come up to the number two. Um, Brad, what do you say to? I mean, what do you say to people when it comes down to, you know, this this thing on the dividend though? Because you know, we 
the dividend was ours. The full dividend was ours. That money was taken. And I understand, you know, logically, I understand what you're saying about not taking, uh, you know, robbing from future dividends and everything else. But people have been robbed from already. I mean, they have robbed from the current generation by not giving them their full dividend and damaged the economy and everything else. How You know, give us give me some justification on that. Well, Michael, I, I've, I've looked at the PFD, as, as we've discussed on the show, I've looked at the PFD as a tax, and, and it was a tax for this generation. It was a horrible tax. It was the worst possible tax. Regressive tax hit the middle income and lower income the, last the taking of the, P, the taking of the PFD is what you're saying. Right, right, yeah. Uh, hit the middle and lower income Alaskans much harder than upper income Alaskans. Worst possible tax you could, you could put together. But I've looked at it as a tax on this generation to help pay for a portion, just a portion of the deficits that we've run up. Um, you know, if we've, if we've drawn $20 billion down uh, over the last seven years, I mean, those are the deficits that this generation has, has, has incurred. And we've left, uh, we've left that, we're leaving that generation or leaving that deficit, <clears throat> excuse me, to future generations. They're the ones who are going to have to refill uh, the CBR, so the CBR is there to uh, to deal with uh, uh, with uh, future problems, um, and so it, it, this generation has 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 uh, had a lot of spending. Our representatives have approved a lot of spending. There hasn't been the revenue to pay for it. We've had these deficits, and I'm one that believes. I, when we we talk about this when we talk about Congress. I'm one that believes that each generation ought to pay its own way. It ought to it ought to be responsible. Um, uh, for covering the cost that it that that it inflicts on that that, that it incurs, um, and and leave uh, a better tomorrow to future generations than, or at least the same uh, to future generations than uh, than it found itself. So, I, I view the, the the PFD cuts that we've had uh, the last three years as this generation's frankly small contribution. Uh, it's about two and a half billion dollars of PFD cuts compared to the twenty billion dollar uh, 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 gap deficit that we've had. I viewed it as this generation's horribly constructed wrong policy, but this generation's small some small contribution uh, toward the cost that's inflicted. If we pay that PF those PFD cuts back, if we take that two and a half billion dollars and pay it back. Uh, uh, to to the current generation, you know, give it say, you know, we we shouldn't have taken this tax. We're going to give it back to you. We've just moved two and a half billion dollars more. Kick that down the can down the road to future generations that that they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to deal with. And and I just I I think that's from a generational standpoint, which is a lot of what the permanent fund's about generational equity, uh, uh, treating each generation of Alaskans, giving each generation of Alaskans that sort of leg up. Um, I think from a, from a generational standpoint, intergenerational standpoint, that's just horrible policy. Um, once you collect, once you, it's a horrible tax. I'm not, I, I can't defend PFD cuts as a tax, uh, the, the structure of the tax. But once you tax a generation to cover at least a portion of its costs, it's the cost it's, it's incurred, um, uh, you shouldn't be giving that back uh, to that generation uh, unless somehow they've generated a surplus, unless somehow they've, they've covered their costs plus a little bit more. And this generation certainly hasn't done that. So I have a problem with, with because, of, because of viewing it as a tax, I have a problem with saying uh, we ought to give that back, uh, we, ought to, we ought to rebate that uh, to, uh, to the current generation of Alaskans and kick that additional cost down the road uh, to future Alaskans. Brad Keithley is our guest, uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Probably that that thought, although logical, is probably not going to go over well with a lot of Alaskans, especially those that feel like they've been shafted. But at the same time, we're the same Alaskans that have allowed our government to run amok and expand and grow to the point to where this, I mean, this is what they were doing to try and pay for it all. I mean, yeah, we're, exactly. we're going to have to come to – I mean, trust me, I'd be the first guy in line to say I'd like my $20,000 back because that's what was taken from my family over the last three years was over $20,000. I'd love to have that. 
But at the same time, we have allowed this government to grow and grow and grow and grow and just sat back and said it's somebody else's problem. Uh, it looks like they have a good administration in there to get it done, but uh, 30 seconds, Brad. Well, uh, you're, you're, uh, yes, your generation will get $20,000 back, but it's going to be at the expense of your kids and your grandkids and their grandkids because once, once you take that $20,000 out of the ERA, it's no longer generating earnings. It's gone, it's gone from the investment base. Yeah. And so your, your generation, our generation is going to benefit from that. But it's going to be at the, at the expense of your of our kids and our grandkids down the road who will have lower PR, PFDs uh, and lower contributions from from the permanent fund to uh, to government yep. costs. All right, we're continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, he's the director over there, managing director. We've gone over number one of the weekly top three. Number one was uh, the effect of the PFD on what we're doing. Uh, here in the long run and it's still uncertain but it's go there's going to be a cost and where does it come from uh, but he wants to move on now we're going to talk about the number two the number two is Governor Dunleavy's pick now for uh, director excuse me for um, for the uh, DOR commissioner director of revenue uh, and that is Bruce uh, Tangeman. Uh Brad what are your thoughts based on what you've seen so far appointments uh governor appointments that are that are important to me from a fiscal standpoint one is the omb director we've talked about uh governor dunleavy's appointment of of uh, of her um uh to that role uh in past shows the second is the uh is the commissioner of revenue um and last week governor dunleavy before the earthquake was going to be you know be and, and ae in some of our discussions, right? But before the earthquake, uh, uh, Governor Dunleavy ab appointed Bruce Tangeman as the commissioner as the commissioner of revenue. Bruce is a longtime uh, government um, uh, worker. Uh, he, I remember when Bruce was uh, one of the staff uh, in the legislature uh, back um, in the Parnell administration, even before the Parnell administration, uh, certainly back in the Palin administration, and. Uh, has uh, has a long had, had a history of of working uh, uh, for the finance committees uh, in the legislature. Then he became uh, uh, deputy director of the Department of Revenue uh, under Angela Rodell when Angela was commissioner during the uh, Parnell administration um, and served in that role uh, until the beginning of the Walker administration or near the beginning of the Walker administration. And then moved over uh, and uh, and was uh, one of the senior staff at the Alaska Gasoline Development Corporation, uh, working on financing matters at uh, AGDC. Um, and then uh, when uh, uh, Governor Walker sort of had his oh clearances uh, at AGDC, clearing out uh, some of the Parnell people and, and installing his own people at AGDC, Bruce moved um, uh, back to the legislature. Um, joined the Senate uh, staff of the Senate Majority and was the Senate Majority uh, Policy Director working on, again, on fiscal matters. So Bruce has a long background uh, on state fiscal issues um, from a variety of perspectives, uh, legislative, executive branch, and, uh, and, and AGDC, one of the, one of the uh, important uh, uh, state-owned state corporations. Um, and so really is is well has a has a has experience that he can draw on in this role. I've been critical of the appointment um, for this reason. Uh, the last few years, Bruce has been policy director uh, of the Senate majority uh, for fiscal matters. And what has the Senate majority's fiscal policy <laughs> been? It's been uh, to continue spending a heck of a lot. Right. Uh, ag agree to spending uh, more than uh, more than we can afford. Uh, agree to continuing to drain the the savings accounts that we're now going to find problematic as we deal with earthquake earthquake costs, and uh, to cut the PFD, uh, the worst possible uh, 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 tax uh, on Alaskans that we could possibly have had uh, at a time of recession. And some people will forget this. Some people want to blame Governor Walker as being the first to come up with PFD cuts. In fact, it was the Senate uh, that was the first to come up uh, with PFD cuts before Governor Walker uh, three years ago did 
uh, his veto of the PFD, the Senate had passed a bill uh, that uh, would, would make uh, PFD cuts permanent. It was it was a forerunner of SB 26, which they passed last session, but it was more than SB 26 because it said, "And you shall, we shall recalculate uh, the PFD in a way that basically would have cut the PFD from 50% of earnings down to 25% of earnings." Um, and under some circumstances, lower even uh, than that. That was that was a Senate bill that had passed the Senate, uh, didn't pass the House right. due to due to you know the work of Lynn Gaddis and, and Tammy Wilson uh, and Scott Kawasaki, frankly. But uh, it had passed this passed the Senate, and that was the Senate's fiscal policy. Right. So so we've got a guy who's coming now into government, coming into a key role, Department of Revenue, uh, a key role who has a history. Of having worked uh, uh, on on the very type of fiscal policy uh, 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 approaches that have caused the problem we're in, uh, and have caused the PFD cuts. Now, some some will defend Bruce by saying, "Well, he was just carrying out what the Senate wanted, what the senators wanted," and others defend him by saying, "Well, he's he's a pretty good technician, uh, has all this experience, and he'll just do whatever Governor Dunleavy wants." But but I've been in some of these rooms, right? I mean, the Department of Revenue is not just an, a, a green eye shade accountant who carries out the will of others. He's he's responsible for making advising right? on and in some instances setting policy uh, with respect to how uh, how the state deals with revenue and deals with its uh, with with at least the income side of the of the income statement. Right. Right. Yeah. It, well, and, uh, and and Bruce's Bruce's history on that's just not been anything that I think is something to e either consistent with the Dunleavy administration pronouncements or what I think has been good policy. Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is with us discussing the governor's pick for commissioner of revenue. So do you think this is a direct, I mean, is this an even cancellation for uh, Dana Andrewin for the OMB budget? I mean, she's the budget hawk. She's the hatchet woman that comes in and cuts. And then you've got the same old, same old business as usual at the Department of Revenue. Um you know, is it is it an equal cancellation or is this a temporary thing? What you know, I, I think it's a lost opportunity. I think, you know, Dunleavy, Governor Dunleavy ran on preserve the PFD, get spending down, uh, uh, take government off the backs of uh, of Alaskans. And I think there were people out there. I, Lynn Gaddis is one. There were people out there who are strong advocates of the PFD who I think would go to work every morning uh, tell, asking themselves, how do we preserve the PFD today uh, and give Governor Dunleavy and, and develop proposals and give Dov Governor Dunleavy advice that would do that. I think it's a lost opportunity to have somebody in, in that role that has the background on policy issues that Bruce does. And the biggest thing, of course, is with his track record thus far, and I think you've done a, a good job here of lining it all out, specifically being on the cutting edge or on the forefront of the PFD cuts and, uh, and, and you know, growing this government. Uh, I mean, what can we do at this point? Well, we, we can't do anything. I mean, uh, Bruce is the governor's appointment, um, and, and he'll go to the legislature, and the legislature is a Republican in both bodies. Uh, now with Bart's win, uh, and and it'll, and Bruce will be confirmed. So there's really nothing we can do about it. I, you and I, I will talk about it uh, both on the program and and in my various uh, the, the various writings I do about you know, my concerns and if I think Bruce is going down the wrong track, I'll certainly highlight that and hopefully people will listen. Uh, but I, Bruce is going to be the commissioner of revenue. We'll just uh, I just think it's a lost opportunity. I think big role major opportunity to get somebody in there that would help uh, you know, develop policies that I think are going to further the Dunleavy administration would go to work every morning with the right attitude. Uh, and I just think it's a lost opportunity. I think it's sort of a, a, a zero uh, where we could have, you know, a plus five or a plus six or a plus 10. Uh, if Brad Keithley had been in charge of appointments um, and, uh, you know, and made those decisions, uh, would you have taken a look at all the different, uh, especially the appointees in the administration, and basically said, 
Uh, if you have been part of past administrations or if you've been part of the governmental mechanism for a long time in in the you know bureaucracy of where you're at, that's a strike against you, and I probably wouldn't be putting you back in there because it's business as usual. Would you have been shaking up the players? I would have, I would have been a shaking up player, but I, I'm not sure I would have ruled people out solely because they had worked for government. I mean, again, going back to Lynn, Lynn served as a representative uh, for uh, a couple of terms and 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 was in government. But I think she came to I think she comes to it with the right attitude about we're going to preserve the PFD. That's that's just a given. Now, right. how are we going to figure out the other issues uh, with that with that off the table? Um, and I think there are people who have that attitude who've been in government that that would have been that would have been uh, a plus. Not, it wouldn't have been a lost opportunity. It would have been a gain for the administration. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. Uh, we've done two of the top three. Back into the break now, uh, Brad. Um, I mean, I want to talk about the number three, which, of course, is the tariff truce. What truce? What does that mean uh, for us? Um, but one of the things that I think, um, uh, one of the things that was said here in the chat room that I thought was uh was kind of an interesting point was that um, it sounds like when you're going back to talking about the PFD that you're saying that the um, that the monies that they've taken, that that's government monies now. And that, you know, you and I have talked about that, that you don't believe that the PFD is necessarily government money. It's our money. But the way you're talking about it makes it sound like it's government money. You're classifying the PFD as government wanting money, once it's been taken, it shouldn't be returned at that point. So I just wanted you to address that before we go to the number one. Well, number it's like any tax. I mean, a, a basic, a federal, in, the federal income tax takes what is our money. Uh, government takes that money and turns it into government money and and spends it. Uh, the PFD, the, the the steps that the legislature took on the PFD was no different, to, in my mind. It was a tax. It took. Uh, it was it was our money. Uh, it was it was Alaskans' money. Certainly, do them under the statute. Do them under under the philosophy that underlies uh, underlies Governor Hammond's support for the PFD. Um, it was it was certainly our money. But just like an income tax at the federal level, uh, government took it took a portion of it to help pay for uh, the costs of government. Uh, it was a bad policy. It is a bad policy. Hopefully, uh, we don't continue with that. Although some in the Alaska Senate say have said we should, uh, but it's a, it's a bad policy. Uh, but just like federal income taxes, I mean, it, government took it and it became, it became government money as a result, as a result of the tax. And nobody talks about, let's, let's take that just a second further. Nobody talks about rebating past federal income taxes because they know that we've been running deficits at the federal level and they know to rebate that money back to citizens would just increase those deficits and increase the debt, national debt, and increase the problems we're kicking down the road uh, to future generations. It's the same thing with the PFD. The PFD tax um, operated in the same way. It helped offset the deficits that we that we otherwise uh, were running at the state that our representatives were otherwise enacting at the at the state level, um, and to. Uh, and to now say we ought to give that money back to the, the tax, ought to give that back to Alaskans, it ha- creates the same problems it would if at the federal level we were talking about giving uh, federal income taxes back uh, back to Americans. It just increases the debt and increases the, the costs that were, uh, the burdens that we're passing on to, uh, passing on to future generations. So it was it was our money. It is Alaskans' money, but government took it uh, in the same way that they take a uh, portion of our income under federal income taxes and used it to offset some of the spending. Right. And you're saying, you keep saying the PFD, but you're talking about the PFD cuts are a tax, not the PFD yes. itself, right? Yes. Just so yes. for clarification in the chat room. Yeah. Th- thank you for doing that for me, Michael, or I make it even more confusing. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. PFD cuts. Um, and, of course, I agree with uh, one of the things that Harold said is here is that, you know, the, the one of the things that folks need to get used to is the idea of government cutbacks. That's what it's going to take. That's the only thing that's going to bring us back in line is cutting back on the size and scope of government. It, it, it is, but you can't say Whoa. to me, you can't <laughs> say that, that, that that's going to that offsets the impact of of, of rebating the PFD uh, uh, tax. 
the past PFD tax because that money's already been spent. That that twenty billion dollar hole we've created is already there. Yes, we need to get it smaller going forward, but we can't undo that twenty billion dollar hole that's been created. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we got about two and a half minutes here, Brad, for your number three, which is the uh, the truce, the tariff truce. Right. So uh, uh, the president met with the Chinese premier uh, in Argentina uh, Monday evening they, or uh, Sunday evening, I guess it was. Uh, they had dinner um, and and they've declared a truce uh, in the tariff wars. And, and that's important to Alaska for a lot of reasons, but a principal one of which is I think that's been a big uh, uh, stumbling block, a big problem in in pursuing the Alaska LNG project. Because that Alaska LNG set aside who pays for the investment, Alaska LNG depends on China uh, as a big market for uh, for the product. We have to. That's where the that's where the market is, um, and the uh, and the the tariff wars have have been very problematic in that. The truce doesn't resolve the tariff war. I mean, it's not time to say okay, now let's get LNG going again. Um, uh, and and the truce uh, the truce is 90 days to to see if we can negotiate a, a resolution of the tariff disputes. Um, and, and we may not resolve it in 90 days, but, but at least it's better. <laughs> the truce is a positive in the sense that it's better than making the tariff dispute worse. The president was, was threatening if we didn't have some sort of uh, rapprochement with the, with the Chinese, was threatening to expand the tariffs, expand the goods that the tariffs applied to, deepen the the, the the amount of the tariffs on uh, on goods that it applied to, uh, and essentially keep going down this road of of enhancing the war. So we sort of stopped that at least for the moment, uh, and there's going to be this 90 day negotiation, which will likely take longer, but this 90 day negotiation to try to resolve uh, the tariff dispute. That's a good sign uh, from the standpoint of Alaska LNG. The the Chinese will likely engage again. Uh, on on LNG to sort of have it in ready ready mode right. uh, in the event the tariff disputes are resolved. All right. Well, we're going to watch this closely. Uh, we'll see what happens, and we will continue to see how this all shakes out uh, between the Dunleavy administration, the gas line, and everything. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on board and talking again today. We will uh, continue to uh, watch this closely. Michael, thanks as always for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.